So let's get started with some of the basics. I'm going to be starting every tomato in six cells. These are pretty small overall in terms of how much soil volume there is. I'm using these universal bottom trays, which are essentially built to last a lifetime. And now really quickly about the soil that's in here. I like to do something a little different for my tomatoes. This is a mixture of high quality potting mix, compost, a little bit of worm castings, and all that together is more nutritious than a standard seed starting or potting mix. And the reason why I do that is because I'm going to be putting more than one tomato per cell. I'm going to be letting them get pretty big before I actually split them up and transplant them. So I wanted to make sure I have enough nutrients in there to support multiple tomatoes per cell and to give them plenty of nutrients so they could grow nice, big, and vigorous. Now, I actually went through and chose all my tomatoes and pre-wrote the labels. On each label, I wrote the name of the variety, what kind of growth habit it has, so like indeterminate, determinate, maybe dwarf, and then what I wrote tomato just so I knew that these were all tomatoes. And the last thing I wrote is sort of the style tomato that it is. So in this case, I wrote cherry tomato. For others, I might write big, medium, something like that, so that I know when I grab the tag exactly what I'm growing. Let's start with the Sakura. This is a small cherry tomato that has a lot of disease resistance and tends to ripen pretty early. So this is one of the earlier cherry tomatoes I'm expecting to get. It should be quite vigorous throughout the whole season because it's one of these tomatoes that's used a lot in production growing. Now the next one up is Gardener's Delight. This is from Botanical Interest. It is a cherry style tomato and it is an indeterminate. So this one's called Sugar Lump apparently as well. They are very flavorful and sweet, so I wanted to give that a try. My overall tomato selection for cherries are, is, is pretty weak, I have to say. So this year I'm making a concerted effort to try to grow a few more cherry tomato varieties, something different, and this is definitely a new one to me. Now, next one up is one that I grow every single year without fail, and that is the Sun Gold Cherry. This is such a classically delicious tomato. It has this really bright pop of sweetness, but also has a lot of complex flavor. It's not just like sugar, nothing else. Now this is one of these varieties that's well known and quite famous for how delicious it is. It can be hard to find in the store because they have a tendency to crack. Now last year, me and Kevin decided that since they crack so easily, we actually harvested them a little bit early and let them ripen indoors, which reduced a lot of that cracking and let you enjoy that tomato for much longer. This next tomato is quite special. It's one that I've always heard about. If, I believe it goes by a different name as well. In this case, the variety has been named Godzilla. This is a really fascinating tomato. Now imagine you had a large beefsteak tomato, but instead of it being one tomato, it's actually like 10 to 20 tomatoes stuck together. That's basically what this ends up looking like. But it's legend has it that it's one of these tomatoes that was bred for stacking. So you would grow this big tomato, throw it in your backpack, and when you go hiking in the mountains, every time you get hungry, you would just rip off a little chunk, snack on it, and keep going. So overall, this guy's definitely going to be a unique one that brings a lot of character in the garden. I'm excited to see if it actually tastes good though. All right, next up is Sweetie, which is a cherry tomato. You might notice that some of them say pole or bush. Pole is another way of saying that it's an indeterminate tomato. So that means that it's going to be growing for a long period throughout the season. Its fruit ripeness is going to be happening over a long window instead of a determinate tomato, which tends to grow for a certain period of time and set all of its fruit at once. Now this next one is new to me once again. It is Austin's Red Pear Tomato. Now this one comes from Seed Savers Exchange, which is one of my favorite places to get seeds. They do a great job of preserving and carrying on. So this one is similar to the Yellow Pear, which unfortunately I'm the only one in this house who really likes the Yellow Pear. I think it's really creamy and makes a really nice tomato sauce, but others don't like it as much. It's not as complex of a tomato flavor, but something about the creamy texture of it, I really like. So I wanted to try this red pear to see if I can maybe convert some people in this house. So before we get to the big beefy slicing tomatoes that everyone loves and knows to grow every single year, I'm actually going to be mixing it up this year with a selection of determinate tomatoes. So all of these come from botanical interest. I'm gonna quickly read off some of their variety names. This one's Mound Merit, which has apparently excellent flavor. So you know I have to get that. Ace 55, which has a lower acidity, so we'll see how I like that one. Italian Roma, which is a classic Roma-style tomato, should be great for making sauces. Supremo, which is another sort of Roma-style tomato, again, great for sauces. And the last one here is Glacier, which is a classic variety that is known to bear tomatoes quite early in the season and quite vigorously, even when it's cold. So that's a nice guy to really start off the season because it's going to do well in a wide variety of conditions. So since these are all new to me and I actually don't know which one I'm going to like the most, I'm only going to start two cells each of each variety and I'm gonna grow them all out this year and see the one that I like the most so that I could continue to grow that next year. So I'm not gonna go too crazy on these, 
but I'll probably put two seeds per cell just to ensure that I have ideal germination. While I finish planting these last couple determinate tomatoes, I want to quickly show you guys exactly how I like to fill these six cells for your best success. And here's how I actually like to fill my six cell trays. Get a big scoop of soil, throw it into each one of them, and then I come through with two fingers. I poke to the bottom of each one of these six cells. So if I flip it over, you could see that there's soil all the way at the very, very bottom of the tray. That's ideal for when you're bottom watering because then the soil will wick up the moisture, bring it all the way to the top. Now when we come back to fill these all the way, we're gonna take our soil and loosely just top off each tray, scrape the surface, and that's it. You'll get a tray that has soil at the bottom for easy bottom watering and isn't too compact because at the end we just scooped in some light fluffy soil without any compaction whatsoever. Now let's get into the tomatoes that I'm most excited for and that is the big boys. These are the heirlooms, the slicers, the beef steaks, whatever you want to call them. They tend to be a slightly larger tomato and all of these are indeterminate. So they share a couple qualities here. Actually, I did lie, there are a couple mid-sized tomatoes in here and there's actually a really unique one that we're gonna start with first. And its name is Baronia. It was actually a dwarf tomato. Now, there are two kinds of dwarf tomatoes that you might have heard of. There's micro dwarfs, which are those tiny tomatoes that you could grow in like a half gallon pot. And they only get like one foot tall and have a bunch of cherry tomatoes. I grew a few of them last year. This year I decided that I'm going to cut back on how many I'm growing just because I want to try some new varieties. But the one that made my list to grow again is Baronia because it is a Cherokee purple-esque type tomato. And that is my favorite tomato for eating on fresh salads, fresh tomato sandwiches anything like that where you're actually just enjoying and eating the fruit itself. Next up from Johnny Seeds is Granadero. This is a plum style tomato that I'm very excited to be growing again because it has resistance to powdery mildew. Now powdery mildew can be pretty annoying here in San Diego since we're on the coast. We tend to get a lot of this coastal fog which powdery mildew just absolutely loves. So I wanted to try growing a powdery mildew resistant variety and this guy was the one that came up. It makes wonderful plum tomatoes that make really great sauce. We had really fallen in love with it last year because it did truck through all the powdery mildew. It had less overall, but it also seemed to be less affected when it did get powdery mildew. So I'm definitely growing this one again to make lots of tomato sauce this year. This next one is called Trophy Tomato. And it comes from the Seed Savers Exchange again. This one's called Trophy because it used to sell for $5 a packet back in 1870, which apparently is equivalent to $80 today. Now, of course, it's not that expensive right now. This is a standard seed packet price, but apparently it's quite delicious and was rumored to have won a lot of trophies for its prized taste. This tomato is probably the most famous one in this list. It is the Cherokee Purple, one of the kind of big heirloom tomatoes to kickstart our heirloom tomato craze that we are in today. And it's actually one of my personal favorites. Now, some people don't like the kind of darker purpley tomatoes. I find the Cherokee purple isn't really that purple. It just has this kind of purple blush to it. So this is one that every year, if I'm, if I'm somewhere where I can grow tomatoes, and trust me, I'm not gonna live anywhere where you can't grow tomatoes, I'm going to be growing Cherokee purple because it's just our standout favorite. We haven't found one that we really like more than this. Every year we just keep coming back to it. This next one, I remember growing, but I can't quite remember how I felt about it. It's called Italian Heirloom, a very descript name. This is one that's considered to be one of the more productive tomatoes and also one of the tastiest tomatoes by Seed Saver Exchange. So to me, that's all I really need to hear. It's delicious, it's one taste of words, and it's productive. Sign me up. So let's go ahead and grow a bunch of these guys as well. All right, as I said, here is another Cherokee Purple type tomato. This one's called Cherokee Carbon. This is a hybrid version of the Cherokee Purple, I believe. It is a cross between two heirlooms. I'm actually not sure right now whether it's an F1 hybrid or not, meaning that it's true to seed. Now this is a plant that I actually purchased from the nursery as a ready start last year. I saw Cherokee and I knew that I had to have it and it was really delicious. It had a smaller fruit than the Cherokee Purple in my experience, but the flavor was so outstanding and actually produced a lot more than the Cherokee Purple heirloom itself. So I'm really hoping that that's true again this year because this is the first time I've grown it from seeds. I'm really happy to see the botanical interest has that available. Now, one thing I'll mention really quickly is that when you go into the world of sort of hybrid tomatoes rather than heirlooms, the prices are going to be a lot more expensive. So this one is $6 for a seed pack, whereas 
the standard Cherokee Purple is $2.29. So this one costs three times as much and you get half the amount of seed. And that's because it's just labor intensive to produce these hybrid tomatoes. You can't just take the seeds and regrow them. You have to manually create them every year. So it takes a little bit more effort, but hopefully that effort pays for itself in terms of the disease resistance, the yield, things like that, or like the vigor of the growth itself. So that's why you kind of choose those hybrid tomatoes over the heirloom tomatoes sometimes, because you just need a little bit more disease resistance or you need a little bit more vigor, anything like that. Generally, that's what they breed those hybrid tomatoes for. This next one's actually pretty funny. It's called Lava Flow, and you can see it's in a white unlabeled packet because I saved the seed myself. And it actually says from Kevin's salsa bed. So it's from 2021. So Kevin grew this a couple years ago. And I remember I took a tomato home. Me and Katrina tried it and we're like, oh, this is a really good tomato. I looked it up. It was a actual heirloom, so not a hybrid, which meant that the seed would be true to growth. And so I fermented some seed and set it aside and saved it. So this year, I'm going to be growing it. I believe it comes from Hawaii. That's why it's called Lava Flow. And they're a pretty nice kind of smaller size tomato, maybe only two to three inches across, which is really great for salads, salsas, things like that. So this guy is a classic heirloom type tomato. It's called Dester. It's been around for a long time. It's called Deeply Satisfying. It is a pink beef steak, and it looks like it makes a pretty good size. I actually haven't opened this one, so this is a new tomato variety to me. So let's see if we like it. I have heard about it before. It is one of those well-known heirloom tomato varieties. So we'll see how it goes this year. Up here, we have another home safe seed. This is Omar's Lebanese. It makes this really big, huge kind of pink beefsteak. Actually saved this seed in 2020. So it's now a couple years old and I might've done it on the paper towel method instead of the fermenting method. This was definitely saved. It's sort of this classic old school method where <laughs> instead of fermenting the seed, you actually just take the seed, stick it to a paper towel, and then let it dry. This doesn't preserve the seed as long as a fermentation does, but if you're just growing it after one or two years, it should be very viable and it's really quick and easy to plant. All you do is you tear off a little piece of paper that has that tomato seed on it, and that's what you actually just throw in the ground. The paper is not gonna do any harm. It'll just biodegrade and the tomato will form with no problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and spray the surface of all these seeds to make sure that they're nice and wet and stick to the soil and they can't blow around. Next up is another really well-known sort of heirloom tomato. It's called Moscovich, I believe. This is one of these early tomatoes. It has a name similar to Moscow because it tends to grow in a colder climate. So this one says that it has 46 ounce tomatoes, which is actually quite a nice size with a rich classic flavor and it's cold tolerant. So if you're living, living somewhere where maybe the early summer or spring is a little bit chilly, here I'm actually in coastal California, which is a little chillier at the start of the season. So this should actually do quite well here at that early time of the year. All right, this next tomato is one that you're just not going to find at your average seed supplier, or maybe anywhere in the United States. That's because I got it from Bulgaria. So this one is called Rozov Blian. And we grew it last year, we grew actually five different Bulgarian tomatoes. And from what I recall, this is the one that we actually liked the most. It had a wonderful flavor. It was a nice pink sized tomato that was maybe about this big, um, sort of the size of a nice orange. And really the flavor was quite good. The others were fine, but the production just wasn't that great. I think it might've just been a climate mismatch with where the seed was produced. But this one, for whatever reason, did great. So we're gonna definitely grow this one again. Okay, we're down to the last couple here. And this guy is one of these really expensive fancy tomatoes that I grew last year. It's called Marbon. It is a maxed out hybrid. It's designed to be very vigorous, very disease resistant, and have a similar flavor to a classic heirloom tomato. So that's a great tomato. I definitely want to try growing it again. It had a really good flavor. Honestly, I don't really know if it outperformed everything that well, but last year I grew all my tomatoes in this patch right here, and they actually all ended up suffering from root knot nematode. So I don't know if this is one of the main disease resistances that it has. Root knot nematode isn't really a disease, it's more of a pest. So it's kind of harder, but there are some tomatoes that do apparently do better against root knot nematode. What I'm going to do instead is just not grow tomatoes right here this year. The last two tomatoes are the ones I'm most excited for. First up is Fortamino, which is actually technically a rootstock tomato. So it's a tomato that you actually don't grow for the fruit at all. You're not gonna eat this tomato in any way whatsoever. You're only growing it so you could graft another tomato onto it. Now this is similar to how most fruit trees are grown. They're all grafted to another sort of fruit tree rootstock. 
And that rootstock has a lot of benefits that it could pass on to the tree that's above ground. And some of those benefits are disease resistance, yield, vigor, things like that, where you could actually take a heirloom tomato, like a Cherokee purple, graft it to the Ford Tomino, and make it grow similar to a hybrid tomato. You get the best of both worlds where you get all the resistances, the vigor, the yield of that sort of hybrid tomato with that classic flavor of the Cherokee purple. So I'm going to be grafting as many tomatoes as I can this year. It's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit harder than just growing a tomato. So I'm probably going to have to order another packet of these so that I have plenty of options. It can be a little tricky, but we're going to be doing a lot of content on that this year. So stay tuned to see exactly how this process works. And this is the last seed here that I'm sowing today. This is the Delicious Hunt. And this comes from a very special tomato. It's a tomato I grew this last summer. They weighed a whopping 2.75 pounds, the biggest tomato I've ever personally grown. So I actually saved the seeds because I want to see if I could continue these genetics. And I don't know, maybe we could do a little giveaway in the future where you guys could each get some of these seeds to try to grow your own giant tomato. But we'll see if this is true to seed. Maybe this year it won't be such a giant and I'll suffer a little bit more. But I have pretty high hopes. I might even share a plant or two with Kevin to see if he could beat me using my own sort of tomato seeds. And it looks like I probably have about, I don't know, 30 or 50 seeds left. So that's a pretty good stash. These were fermented, so they should last for quite a few years. Now let's take this tomato sort of tray and bring it into my special germination chamber. But first, before I do that, I'm gonna go through, top each one of these with a little bit of soil to make sure that they're well seeded and they have everything they need to grow. So once I have a decent amount of soil covering each seed cell, I'll come through and just pat down on the surface with my hand, give that good soil contact to make sure that they could properly germinate. Now to place these tomatoes in their special germination room. All right, and we go to the special germination chamber. Now you might be wondering how I built this and I discussed it in a previous video, which I'll link right here. If you guys wanna see another video like this, but about peppers, let me know down in the comments.